Welcome. Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Carol Manny. I have the pleasure of leading the service today with UU member Brad Kefauver. And most of you know Brad, I am sure, because he's my next door neighbor, and that's what makes him well known. Except that some people actually say that they, he's well known because of his engaging summer sermons. So um, for those of you who don't know him at all, he is a system analyst at OSF. He is a lifelong fan of Sherlock Holmes with three books published on the subject and a very, very popular summer service speaker on pop culture topics. Some people might remember his Father's Day sermon on Darth Vader. I'm so glad to have him here today in person. And so we, the members and friends and children and youth of this congregation, strive to live into our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the health and wholeness of the world. In living our mission, we are mindful of those who came before us. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They aided the European settlers who came down the Illinois River. We offer our respect to the Peoria people for who they are, were in the past and who they are today. For those of you who are new or visiting the congregation, thank you for joining us today. I think it's, it can be difficult to um, give it a shot and reach out in hope for some meaning and connection. If you're online, please send a note through the um, website to either me or the church office. And if you're here, I would love to meet you after service. I'm usually outside. And just another note on that, on uh, Thursday night at 6, I'm going to meet with anybody who's at all interested in learning more about UU and UU Peoria, and membership, just anybody who's got any interest at all. And there will be a Zoom link for that also. Quick um, note about what's coming up. Next Sunday's intergenerational service about building blocks to build things. Um, and then the next Sunday is the 24th Peoria businessman, Bob Woolsey, will be here. Bob lives and breathes gratitude. It will be an energetic service. Okay, if you could remember to turn off your phones, please stand as you're able, and we're going to sing, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning.
morning's opening words, as a lot of the words are going to be today, were from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. My dear fellow, said Sherlock Holmes as we sat on either side of the fire in his lodgings at Baker Street, life is infinitely stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. We would not dare to conceive the things which are really mere commonplaces of existence. If we could fly out that window hand in hand, hover over this great city, gently remove the roofs and peep at the queer things which are going on, the strange coincidences, the plannings, the cross purposes, the wonderful chains of events working through generations and leading to the most outre results, it would make all fiction with its conventionalities and foreseen conclusions both stale and unprofitable. So light our chalice this morning. Uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yesterday, our distant ancestors gathered round a flame to share their stories and find comfort. Tomorrow, our descendants will gather round a flame, talking of a life we will never know. But today, it is we who gather here around this flame, seeking, believing, and being together. Today's story comes from an anonymous author, and it has a bit of a preface. I said Conan Doyle earlier, we're going to get away from him for a moment. Because in 2001, a great study was taken worldwide to see what the funniest story in the world was, across countries, across language barriers, all around the world. Now, after gathering the stories that were told the most, the study ran a poll to see which story spoke to the people everywhere how they connected with it, you know, because we always find a little truth in humor. And this is the story they found. Now, I won't say stop me if you've heard this one, because you probably have. The great detective Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watson went camping. Sometime during the night, Holmes nudged Watson awake, and he said, my dear Watson, look up and tell me what you see. Why, Holmes, Watson replied. I see a silvery moon and a galaxy of stars. I see the constellations whose patterns form images from our rith mythological history. I see the vastness of space, the far reaches of the unknown for humanity to one day explore. I see what might be the most beautiful night sky I've ever seen. Well, now Sherlock Holmes, always the thinker, then asked Watson, what simple truth can you learn from all that? And Watson thinks about it some more and he makes a guess that we are but small motes in a wonderfully immense cosmos? The night sky has an even simpler truth to teach us, Sherlock Holmes explained. Try again. So Watson does. That there are worlds out there beyond ours, other Earths revolving around some distant suns, that beings not so unlike us might exist in some of those worlds? You're still thinking too hard, said Sherlock Holmes. Look one more time. So Watson looked up in the night sky, and he gave it some real thought. He just couldn't get it. He said, what am I missing? He finally asked. I should think it should be rather obvious, Sherlock Holmes replied. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Sometimes we overlook what's right in front of us when we're enjoying the view. Dr. Watson was in a pretty happy place there and enjoying the stars, as long as it didn't start raining. If there was rain in the forecast, though, it might have been better to be Sherlock Holmes and notice that they might need a tent before the night was over. Sometimes seeing things from different perspectives at the same time can help us make the most of life, whether we're camping or doing something else. Okay, our invitation to offering, this is Generosity of Spirit by Victoria Weinstein. The purpose of the church is to encourage all who gather there to grow more generous in spirit and in action. This is the great end of all the world's faith traditions, to bring the human being closer to the, the divine by acts of creation and compassion. We now take an offering that allows us to exercise 
that all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support this church and its many ministries. After the ushers pass the plate and while Rosa plays for the meditation, you may light a candle um, for something that's in your heart. Those of you who are online, we light candles on your behalf and you may light a candle at home. So the gifts of the congregation will be most gratefully received. This is a welcoming community where we find connection, a spiritual community where we find meaning. Ours is a sharing community where our joys are amplified, a caring community where our sorrows are lessened. We take this moment to reflect on our joys and sorrows and acknowledge the mutual support of our community. We find today a great joy in the wonderful news. I did announce this last week that Tom Byram, has been through his last round of chemotherapy. I think they might be in California, but that is so exciting. Um, and we ask for healing for Lindy Peterson, who's recovering at home from surgery. I think she's doing well. And may we remember those whose names we have spoken, as well as those we hold in silence in our hearts. If we want to take a moment just to think about all that. Okay, today um, the reading that I have listed in the bulletin is not the one I'm going to do because we've been doing such wonderful stories in our Sunday group after church group and Brad's theme is story and story. 
So I decided to change to um, a very, very simple poem by fo folk singer Mike Jones that was eventually made into music. I'm, I'm a teller of tales, a spinner of yarns, a weaver of dreams and a liar. I teach you some stories to tell to your friends while sitting at home by the fire. You may not believe everything that I say, but there's one thing I'll tell you that's true. For my stories were given as presents to me and now they are my gifts to you. My stories are as old as the mountains and rivers that flow through the land they were born in. They were told in the homes of peasants in rags and kings with fine clothes adorning. There's no need for silver or gold in great store for a tale becomes richer with telling. And as long as each listener has a pair of good ears, it matters not where they are dwelling. A story well told can lift up your hearts and help you forget your sorrows. It can give you the strength and the courage to stand and face all your troubles tomorrow. For there's wisdom and wit, beauty and charm. There's laughter and sometimes there's tears. But when the story is over and the spell is broken, you'll find there's nothing to fear. My stories were learned at my grandparents' home while their grandparents also heard them. They were given as payment by traveling folk for a warm place to lay down their burdens. My stories are ageless, they never grow old. With each telling, they are born anew. And when my story is ended, I'll still be alive in the tales that I've given you. Brett. Well, as Carol just mentioned, I mean, the theme for this summer was telling our stories. And when I heard this and was asked to do a summer service, I thought, well, I'm going to go to my old favorite Sherlock Holmes because I've spoken about him before here and it seemed like a good one for this summer. Because Sherlock Holmes is definitely one of our stories. Technically, there were 60 original stories about the man with the odd name of Sherlock. And, you know, he's been called the world's greatest detective. Those stories were written by Arthur Conan Doyle between 1887 and 1927, but they didn't stop with Doyle. Stories kept coming in books, movies, TV shows, radio dramas, stage plays, cartoons, advertisements, lessons, even music, all to tell stories of Sherlock Holmes. He's been portrayed in one form or another more than any person in fiction. There's even that one not so great joke, which I used as our story today. A joke that's been told around the world because e people everywhere know Sherlock Holmes at this point. Sherlock Holmes is no longer a British detective. He's a Japanese detective in Japan. He's a Russian detective in Russia, Pakistani detective in Pakistan. At this point, he has transcended his very British roots, even if we Americans and our love of English accents like to keep him in England, like James Bond, Doctor Who, and anybody else we want to be a little fancy which works out well for us because the original telling of the stories written in that span of 40 years between 87 and 1927 by an English author, well, they all take place in England. A lot of Sherlock Holmes fans are great Anglophiles by nature, loving things like tea and fish and chips and the queen and all things British. Because in a way to an American, just as you know, those of the Christian faith look at the Jewish people as, of Israel as their kind of cousins across the sea, we tend to look at the English sometimes that way. Just folks like us that didn't make it over to the new world. Of course, we also rebelled against British rule and went our own way, but as allies in two world wars and a number of other battlefields across the years, we look to them as friends. And they are often our actual friends. As Thanks to Zoom, I've gotten to know several people from England over the past couple of years. So it's pretty natural that Sherlock Holmes stories are a well-established part of our culture and our classic literature. They're warm and friendly, nice stories to read by a cozy fire at night, and have nothing at all wrong about them. Nothing that would get Conan Doyle in trouble if he was writing on Twitter today. But you know that's not true. Everybody gets in trouble on Twitter these days, eventually. 
Because, you know, Pal Mark Twain had that one problematic word he liked to use in his books that we don't say here. Well, the Sherlock Holmes stories have their problems, too. I don't want to air too much of Sherlock's dirty laundry here today, but let's do a little gossiping about our British friends and the stories he's in. One of the things that attract fans to the detective writings of Sherlock Holmes is the stories seem pretty real. You finish reading them and you want to think a little more about Sherlock Holmes and the story you just read, you can actually pull out a history book and do a little research. Like his friend, Dr. Watson, who was wounded in the Second Afghan War at the Battle of Maiwan. You can look up that war and that battle and learn all about it and kind of picture Dr. Watson at that point in history. Sherlock Holmes, on his mother's side, had an ancestor who was Vernet the French painter. You can look at art history and look into the fact that there weren't just one famous Vernet painters. There was three famous painters named Vernet, a father, a son, and grandson. Sherlock Holmes' arch enemy had a favorite French painter named John Baptiste Gruz, and it's fun to imagine the Gruzes and the Vernets fighting back in history over art, just because Sherlock Holmes and Professor Moriarty fought. The 60 stories of Sherlock Holmes are not only rich with history, at this point they are history. And that's kind of where it gets into the not nice part. Because if you work through the cases that our famous detective solved, you see that certain trends pop up. Most of the trouble that causes the mystery Sherlock Holmes solved seemed to come from London from somewhere else, from Italy, Australia, Germany, South Africa, India, South America, Central America, and the United States of America. And when it wasn't citizens of those countries, it was an Englishman who probably got corrupted from spending too much time in one of those countries. Because at the time of Sherlock Holmes, the city of London was the largest city in the world, a capital city of a worldwide empire, ruled by a queen whose name defined the, that entire age of humanity, the Victorian age. Sherlock Holmes and those stories of his are this captured bubble of a glorious era that people like to remember or to remember a version of it. I mean, over the years, you've probably heard people talk about some golden age that they lived through, whether it was the 1950s or the 1980s when, you know, things were all great. And over in England, the Victorian age was kind of a golden age, or age lovingly remembered, if you're British. Now, there's a British sketch comedy show called The Mitchell and Webb Look, that you might have seen. It has a great sketch in their very first episode about two Nazi soldiers talking to each other in the trenches of World War II. They're talking about the little skull symbol that's on their caps and wondering why it's there. And at one key point of the skit, one of the soldiers turns to the other one and says, are we the baddies? It's a good question and one we should ask more often. I mean, the only reason Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watson met was because and Watson would, got wounded in that Battle of Maiwan was because the British Empire decided to invade Afghanistan just to keep them from getting friendly with Russia. In the opening of the first novel, Watson's telling how he became an army surgeon and headed to Bombay to join that campaign. Why Bombay? Because the British had basically invaded India over the century before, taking any leaders out who stood in their way to stop their trade. They could basically then run armies out of Bombay because they took over there. The world at the time of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson was a world overwhelmingly ruled by a country about the size of Kansas. They didn't have little skulls on their caps and they didn't ask themselves, are we the baddies? But I'm sure some people did because if you go back and you look at history and what was going on with that worldwide power and the things they did to hold on to that power, you might go, yeah, they were definitely some baddies. We're getting to see the other side of things more and more as streaming services like Netflix bring us movies from other lands and we get to see things from other points of view. But back then at the turn of the 19th century when Sherlock Holmes was being written, we were pretty much looking into things from England's point of view. Yet the evidence was there of these other things. I mean, it's right in the stories. So many of the mysteries that he was solving were the result of England's invasions and colonizations coming back to haunt the citizens of England. Like in one story, a young soldier sees the pale form of his army buddy that he thought died in the Second Boer War. 
and Sherlock Holmes has to investigate. What is he seeing? There's no mention of the concentration camps that the British built in South Africa or their scorched earth policies and establishing dominance down there just because some Englishmen wanted some gold that was there. But, you know, if you do the research, if you're trying to learn more from the roots of these stories, it's all there. Whether it's, you know, an old army colonel who died mysteriously and then there was some weird creature in the room and Sherlock Holmes unravels this story of love and tragedy with roots in the Sepoy mutiny of the 1850s, the first time the people of India tried to win their independence and it didn't go so good. And there's just all these sorts of things. And it gets into other cultural things of the English empire at the time where, you know, a lot of the aristocracy was having issues. Like there's a story with a British Lord attempting to wear, marry a wealthy American girl because he has to prop up the estate that he's in danger of losing. He doesn't have the money to keep his grounds and his, his mansion going. There's these other parts of the stories where wealth in other forms looted from other countries brings the downfall of people like treasure from India or this big blue stone that somebody found in the East Indies that a goose has to swallow. I mean, in these Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes makes England look good and everything around him in those stories, when you dig down, it's maybe not so good. It's signs of a country that was exploiting, abusing, and basically doing all the things that that German dictator later wanted to do. But unlike that failed dictator, Queen Victoria got to come out of the era looking like a nice grandmother and not a weirdo with an awful mustache. History gives us a richness to these Sherlock Holmes stories that makes them classics. And, you know, it it's, winds up, at this point, you look back and you see, oh, there's some dark threads woven in there. And it, you might think it might make it, it hard to enjoy these stories. But Conan Doyle did create this one person this, who represented something better. Maybe two people, if you add in Dr. Watson. Because that person became this bright and shining symbol of logic and truth, an idea bigger than just an Englishman with a funny hat and a magnifying glass. The idea that if you looked hard enough at stuff, if you paid attention, you could see the true facts behind the stories you were being told. Like, you know, one of the stories we know very well is the locals out in Dartmoor telling poor Henry Baskerville that a giant demon hound had killed his uncle and was probably going to come kill him. Now, somebody took Henry to see Sherlock Holmes, who eventually showed him that, well, there was a cousin he didn't know about and a painted dog and that was the true facts, not this big story of this demon hound. In another story, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are taking a train out to the countryside and as they're riding along, Watson's enjoying the scenery, kind of like he did in that little story about the tent. And Sherlock Holmes brings up the problem of seeing the truth sometimes. Do you know, Watson, Sherlock Holmes says, that one of the curses of a mind with a turn like mine is I must look at everything with a reference to my own special subject. You look at the scattered houses and you're impressed by their beauty. I look at them and the only thought which comes to me is a feeling of their isolation and of the impunity with which crime could be committed there. They always fill me with a certain horror. It's my belief, Watson, that the lowest and vilest alleys of London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. Now, Watson's pretty horrified by that statement. None of us wants to think of the awful things that exist around us in our everyday lives. The poverty, the abuse, the despair. We have a sense that it's out there, but holding that knowledge constantly in our brains is too much for any of us to bear and still go out and hold a job, have an appetite for dinner, or have hope for the future. None of us can carry the full weight of all the troubles of the world through every moment of our day. We have our limits. And when you think of all the troubles of history, all the stuff out there from the past, it's even worse. I mean, I can't get any inspiration from Sherlock Holmes if I'm constantly thinking about the horrors of war and the conquest that built the British Empire that he grew out of as I read these stories. I still need to acknowledge that that history existed, though, because there's two stories there. One is good and inspirational. The other is a bad lesson, some bad lessons on what we might need to do better. Both of the stories can exist in that same text, that same book of Sherlock Holmes stories. And this is something we're running into these days. There's people in certain states that want to keep parts of our history from being taught in schools. 
They want to keep all the star-spangled, glorious parts of American history and bury all the parts where we treated people horribly. Now, it might be easier to talk about this kind of thing if it were some other country like England and Sherlock Holmes instead of America, and you know, we live here in America. It, and sometimes you gotta ask yourself, does our history make it harder to believe in things like equality or freedom or justice? If somewhere in the past we screwed up and did very bad things on the road to getting here, it might be harder to still accept that we, like Sherlock Holmes at the peak of the British Empire, might be living a better life because of some bad things in the past where people took things away from other people. Slavery was horrible. Dropping nuclear bombs on two cities full of people was horrible. We have been the baddies, even if we didn't stop at time to ask ourselves. History isn't always full of heroes. But I still like reading a comic book with Captain America now and then. Because here's a guy in red, white, and blue, and he's trying to stop hatred. He's trying to stop injustice. He's trying to clear the way for the beliefs that we hold to be self-evident. That all men are created equal with rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, as we read from the Declaration of Independence. Captain America didn't really exist in World War II, but the idea of him did. And that's the thing about those comics that their stories dig deep into because, you know, there are things America shouldn't have done, shouldn't be doing today, and try, are trying to fix. And Captain America, if you wind up reading the current comics, Steve Rogers, he's more painfully aware of the dark side of our nation just because he took the name of the country. If your name is Captain America, you can't help but see all the stuff that's going on in America. And he, in the comics these days, he does fight against it still. Sherlock Holmes gets to skate around a lot of England's past because his name isn't Sherlock Great Britain and he doesn't wear a Union Jack as his cloak, but then he wasn't created in a comic book during a world war. The history is still there in those stories because history is always there. None of us are fictional characters, but our life stories are all rich with history, just like Sherlock Holmes's. History that brought us to this place and history we're living at this very moment. Usually it's pretty subtle. We aren't fighting in a war over in East Peoria or we aren't watching the Illinois River flood downtown at the moment. And Washington DC and its debates can seem pretty far away. But history came knocking on all our doors a couple of years ago when this pandemic hit and we were staying home and wiping off our groceries. We were here for that part of history just as Sherlock Holmes was around for Britain's Days of Empires or Captain America was around for World War II. And there were those people that behaved rather badly. Some of us didn't. And if we step back and look at that recent moment of history as a metaphor for the larger, larger darkers of issues, I think it shows us something. Because if you think about that whole situation, and if your neighbor showed up a few months into the pandemic and said, hey, I'm all out of toilet paper, can I have a roll? And you just went, well, I wasn't hoarding toilet paper, so it's not my fault that wouldn't really be a good answer. I mean, you'd still give your neighbor some toilet paper just if you had some extra because we're good people. But occasionally get people now. They're said trying to do like, well, you know, history wasn't my fault. I don't have to do anything about it now. You can't do that. You can't pretend things didn't happen in the past because, you know, history is there and it's always with us. We don't get to ignore it just because it's a little yucky. I mean, and let me tell you, as a fan of Sherlock Holmes, I've always been aware of this because there's a few things in those stories that are pretty yucky. It was written at a time when racism against Italians was really bad. And a couple of those com stories, they compare Italians to monkeys or other animals. It's the way racists like to do. Even Conan Doyle, he wrote one good story about a biracial family that's very sweet and he, it's a great story, but then later he puts his character right out of a minstrel show in one of his stories, just trying to be funny. It's not really that good. You have these two things that are always going on. I mean, I could get on a big high horse and call Conan Doyle out for his hypocrisy, but there isn't one of us that's made it to being a functional adult without being a hypocrite at some point or the other. We're humans. We try, we fail, we go on. Part of, failure is a part of our thing. We, 
try and then we do better the next time. Sometimes we fail as we're trying to do, but that happens with a lot of great art and literature across the board. Nobody's perfect. But you wind up with these good inspirational things like Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson that definitely should be carried forward and read by future generations. Do I think that the bad parts of the story should be carried forward as well? Well, I mean, we have to be aware of that stuff, so I hate to write it out. I'd hate to have people thinking, oh, Conan Doyle was perfect and did everything perfect because he was like the rest of us. He had flaws, he did some things, said some things, you know, and I think that helps us understand that, hey, even if we aren't perfect, we don't, you know, we can still go on and try to be better. You know, there's writers now, people now that it's like Harry Potter. I know a lot of people, it's like are, you know, J.K. Rowling's come out on the bad side of some things and everybody's like, well, now I can't enjoy Harry Potter anymore. It's like, that's, that's a tough go. I mean, there should be something you can still grab out of this one thing with ignoring the tendencies of the person it came from because that's, that's an issue that is constantly being discussed in you know, circles of readers and stuff. And we have to find that light within us, that light within humanity as a whole and pull that good part out and let that carry us forward. I think that's part of what history brings us. Now, when we get to our closing words today, I'm gonna to have a little poem to read for you about that Sherlock Holmes fans dearly love. It's a little bit flawed too, but just as the stories are flawed, the author might sound a little too nostalgic for the good old days of the Victorian era. He was still writing in the middle of World War II, so you have to cut him a little slack for the fact that England was still fighting war after war during Sherlock Holmes's time, even though it was the good old days. But the poem brings out the idea that some stories are worth carrying on, even with their flaws. So I wanted to include that poem. Our stories are just never simple, but they are our stories, every detail, both light and dark, and we have to accept it all to truly understand our place in this world that we find ourselves. To shine a light in the darkness, you have to first acknowledge that the darkness exists, just like you have to notice that your tent is missing if you're enjoying the stars. So with that, I think we can turn to hymn number 118 and sing a little song about bringing your own light when things get dark. As flame is to spirit, so spirit is to breath, and breath is to song. Though we extinguish the flame in this sanctuary, may we tend it in our hearts until we meet again.
for closing words. This little poem called 221B. Here dwell together still two men of note who never lived and so can never die. How very near they seem, yet how remote, that age before the world went all awry. But still the game's afoot for those with ears attuned to catch the distant view halloo. England is England yet for all our fears. Only those things the heart believes are true. A fog swirls past a window pane as night descends upon this fabled street. A lonely hansom splashes through the rain. The ghostly gas lamps fail at 20 feet. And here, though the world explode, these two survive. And it is always 1895. Thanks, Blue. Thank you.